What is up, everyone? It is Wednesday, and Wednesday means more Q&A. So thank you to everybody who sent in a question this week. We will again be going over five questions. I had more questions than I can do. So as always, if your question was not answered this week, please keep sending it in so that we can get to them. If you are new to this segment, these are questions submitted from subscribers or viewers of my channel. If you're interested in having your question answered next week, write down below in the comments, please leave your question and I would be happy to get to it. So five questions again this week, my opinion on these topics and on these questions. So let's go ahead and take a look at question number one right now. Do you see cards becoming worthless in 20 years? Younger millennials and Gen Z doesn't seem to collect or even follow sports that closely. Are today's youth going to care about a 52 Monty Irvin? I worry it will be like our parents' porcelain figures. I think, I think this is a really, really good question. And I think it's something that we all think about a lot. Um, what is going to happen long term with carts? Um, you know, I was at I was at an estate sale that we were doing for a family member, and I was talking to um, kind of an estate sailor at the estate sale, and he said to me, "Yeah, it's really interesting that antique furniture." is largely not that popular anymore. And then he went on to say, he goes, yeah, it's like those little Hummel figurines, those little ceramic Hummel figurines that a whole bunch of pe uh, people collected for years and years and years. And he said something that was really funny. He said, yeah, everybody who likes those is now dead. Nobody who's alive wants those anymore. And those Hummel figurines that were pretty expensive and collectible, you know, are a dime a dozen. You can buy them very, very cheaply now. And it's it's hard to know what will have long-term interest. You know, there are, are fashionable things for a short period of time, you know, like Beanie Babies. And then there are things that have held value for a long time and even have a resurgence like cards, like old vinyl records and so none of us really know what is going to happen with sports cards especially vintage sports cards long term and you know your point about you know the gen xers the gen zers is a fair point especially you know as a teacher i'm dealing with high school kids every single day and a lot of the things that you would think they would be interested in, they're just not that interested in anymore. Um, their interests are definitely different. So where things head, none of us really know. Um, I don't think that it is a 100% sure bet that sports cards will be valuable long term. And that like to your point, you know, a 52 Monty Irvin, will be something in high demand long term it's it's really hard to know i will say this if you're simply collecting as an investment i don't know if if that's necessarily the right move to make if you're collecting because you like to collect if you're collecting because you want a hobby i mean quite frankly one of the reasons I got back into cards is because there are so many negative things out there. There are so many unhealthy things going on. Um, so much negativity that I needed a way to distract myself from all of that stuff going on. All of the political turmoil to me is just not enjoyable. And so I'm like, I need something positive to distract me from all of this stuff and to keep my mind preoccupied. And that's one of the reasons I got back into cards because as a kid, it was so much fun. It was such a healthy hobby. It was a good way to meet people, interact with people, spend time with my friends, spend time with my dad. And so that's really why I got back into cards. So 
It's hard to know. Um, is it possible that a lot of people move away from collecting cards and our youth just don't pick it up? That's possible. I think there's always going to be at least a decent amount of demand. There, There is within guys we tend to have in our DNA the love of sports and competition. We also tend to have the love of history and learning about history. And I've said this before, but I think cards are really where sports and history kind of collide. And so I do think there will probably be long-term demand for cards, especially since the supply is so low of some of those cards. I think people will always be interested in the Ty Cobbs and the Cy Youngs and the, you know, Willie Mazes and, and the Mickey Mantles and the Hank Aarons of the world and the Jackie Robinsons of the world. And I think the historical figures especially. But it's a really good question. I don't think we know. I tend to think there will at least be a decent amount of demand for cards long term. Is it possible that they turn into Beanie Babies or Hummel figurines? It's it's definitely possible. I don't anticipate that happening. But again, I would say collect because you enjoy collecting, not because you think you're gonna get rich from it or that they're gonna continue to go up. If you're simply a investor of sports cards, then I don't know. I would say stick with the S&P 500 I don't think that I would be choosing cards as my main source of investment income. Um, but for me and a lot of us, if we're collecting because we enjoy collecting and then they could or probably will go up in value along the way, that's just a bonus. So that's kind of my take on it. Collect because you enjoy collecting. Don't collect because you're gonna make money. If you make money along the way, great. If they become worthless to other people, then who cares as long as you're collecting and having a healthy hobby that you enjoy. What is your favorite card in your collection and why do you like that card? If there was one card that you could have, which card would that be? So I love this question and I answered it once before. Um, the Clemente collector, Theo, had me on his channel and interviewed me and he asked me this question and I told the whole story about the card. So I'm gonna tell you the story behind uh, my favorite card and I'm going to uh, then show you the card itself. So when I was a kid, so I really started collecting in about um, third grade or so. And in third grade, fourth, third or fourth grade, this is like 1987, 1988. And when that happened, I was on a little league team. I was on the Red Sox, was my little league team. You know, we're all assigned a different little league team. And it was in 1987, 88, and the guy was Roger Clemens. Roger Clemens was the dominant pitcher. You know, he's winning Cy Young Awards, he's winning you know, he's in all-star games, he's starting all-star games. I mean, he's the guy. So I'm a pitcher, I'm on the Red Sox, so just naturally as, you know, a third grade kid, I start looking up to Roger Clemens. Well, at the time, the card to have was the 84 Fleer Update Roger Clemens card. And I remember distinctly, and again, this is like 1988, the card was $80. And at the time, $80 for a kid who's like eight, that was like $5,000 today. Is At least that's what it felt like. So what I did was I decided I want this card, but I don't have the money to get the card. So what we would do is uh, we would go to card shows on weekends and occasionally, as my dad started getting back into cards with us, my dad would occasionally be a dealer at a show and so what happened was in 1988 or so maybe 89 my dad was a, a dealer at a show and you know those are long days for us well what happened was i would tag along with my dad 
And at this one particular show, they would have a raffle every hour. And the guy, the promoter of the show was not doing the show to make money. He was doing the show as like a community event. You know, he was trying to basically just break even on the deal, but have a fun community day. And he did it, you know, two, three times a year. So what he did is he would take the money that he made from the show and once an hour, he would have a drawing. And the drawing was, you'd get a ticket when you came in and the drawing was for a uh, hundred dollars in a script, like a hundred dollar credit at the show, but it had to be used at the show. So what we did was my, uh, my brother and I would do this you know, whenever we'd go to the shows is toward the second half of the day as people were leaving it, leaving the show, I would sit by the door and I would ask people, hey, if you're leaving, could I have your raffle ticket? And so people would give it to me. I'm just this little kid, of course. Yeah, here, here's my ticket. So I got to the point where by the end of the day, I, you know, I will have collected 30, 40, 50 tickets. So when they would read the drawing, I would be sitting there looking through a whole bunch of tickets, trying, trying hoping to win. Well, sure enough, I won the drawing and I got a hundred dollar that I had hundreds of dollars that I had to spend in credit at the show. So as soon as I get it, I immediately know, oh my gosh, this is my chance to get the 84 Fleer Clemens if there's someone in the show that has the card. So I go tearing around through all the tables at the show looking to see, does anybody have the 84 Fleer update? Roger Clemens that I can spend my credit from the show at and get the card. This Roger Clemens 84 update card. It was my dream card. Again, $80 at the time was a huge amount of money. And I got it and I've had it ever since. And I am absolutely not going to send it into PSA or SGC because no matter what grade they were to give it, it would, it does not matter to me. This is the exact card. I will always have this card. This will always be my favorite card because it was my dream card as a kid. It was my grail card. And I found a way to get it, even though it seemed impossible at the time. Second part of the question is, what card would I get if I could get any card today? I mean, it's such a difficult question. Um, I've always said my favorite card is the 54 Ernie Banks rookie card because I think it's such an awesome picture of him. And I think he's such a likable guy. He, he He's like, I think he's about 20 years old in the picture. He looks like he's about 16 or 17. I absolutely love the picture. I love the the Yogi Berra rookie card because I love Yogi Berra, but I think my favorite card is the 54 uh, Ernie Banks. I do not have it. I still do not have it, but I, I do think that's my favorite card. So if I had to pick up one, I think I would go with the 54 Tops Ernie Banks rookie card because everything about it, I absolutely love. What are your thoughts on people using titles for grades of cards? I hear investment grade being the same number of the year of the card and collector grade being a grade higher than the year of the card. Are these titles just or fair? You know, this is an interesting question, but quite frankly, I think that my answer, my answer, I don't know how much you'll like my answer. Quite frankly, I don't care what people say is a collector grade or, you know, is a investor grade or that is completely irrelevant to me. The only grade that matters to me is do I like the looks of it? I mean, I have cards in my collection that are sevens uh, in vintage cards that are okay. And I have other cards that are threes and fours that I think are just awesome to look at. I don't really mind a rounded corner. Uh, there, I have cards with creases and wrinkles that don't bother me. Um, to me, that's just marketing. 
That's just advertising. Saying something's a collector grade and that makes them feel better because they have a certain grade. That's great. I, I, it, it's, that's for other people. That is not something that matters to me at all. Um, you know, there's different terms for different things. One person's definition of mint might be different than another. I mean, even looking at grading scales, you know, PSA and SGC have slightly different things on what they allow for a five versus a six, you know? Um, so I, I don't, I don't get caught up in that. Um, and a, re a lot of reason I don't get caught up in it is because I'm a collector. I, I don't, uh, values are all secondary to me. Um, the stuff that I buy, I buy because I like it. If I like the looks of it and it's a two, I'll still buy it. If I, if I don't like the looks of it and it's a seven, I won't buy it. I've seen, I've seen a lot of sevens and eights of vintage cards that I'm, I don't really like the look of, but I have a lot of threes and fours that I think are awesome. So it doesn't really matter to me if somebody else is interested in, in making different categories and different things and that that's fun for them, then that's great. But that's not, that's not my thing. So, um, I would just say, w worry about what you like, collect what you like and let other people worry about titling things and calling things certain things and, and and making little boxes that they fit their stuff into but i'm not i i wouldn't um i wouldn't subscribe to anything that is going to make you think of less of your collection um as long as you like it that is truly the only thing that matters in my opinion when i bid on a card the other night i did not look at comps but assumed a mistake i never make it was higher I was upset at myself at first for overpaying, but the more I look at the card, I'm very happy to be the owner. Have you ever overpaid for a card, but in the end been happy with your decision? You know, this is a really interesting question because I think what a good deal is or what is overpaid is all relative. I mean, there are comps, but, but the thing about the thing about cards is no cards, no two cards are exactly the same. So, I mean, two cards might be sixes, two cards might be sevens. They even might be sevens from the same grading company, but they could be dramatically different. One might be a seven because of certain touches around the corners, and the other one might be a seven because it's off center. And maybe your eye sees off center and, and doesn't like it or sees up, to, uh, up and down centering differently than side to side centering or maybe you don't mind a little wrinkle, or maybe you don't mind wax on the back, or maybe you don't mind a little mark on the card, and other people do, and it affects the grade. So what does overpaid even mean? I mean, I don't, I don't know if there's such thing as overpaid. Um, if, if you like the card and you're happy with the price, I, I really don't know if it matters what someone else would say it's worth. Now, if you're buying a card that you're gonna turn over, then buying a card at a good quote unquote deal, meaning below what the comps are, is important. If you're buying a card that's gonna go into your collection, does it really matter what they're going for? I would say it, it really doesn't matter. Um, you know, if, if there's a house, it, it, and I would say it's just like a house. I mean, if there's a house that the way that the lot is situated and the way that the house is laid out and the way that the yard is, is done and maybe a, a house has some trees that provide shade that really is something that make you like the house more than other people might like it because you're gonna spend a lot of time in the back patio and there's some big trees over the back patio that make it feel like a park and a resort for you, then you might pay more for the house than, than an, another person or the house that's four doors down, that's a similar floor plan. But if you like the house and you're okay with the price, it doesn't matter what other people would pay for it, right? So I think a card is the same way. There are so many 
so there's an infinite number of factors that affect the value of something, the price of something, the grade of something, the condition of something that I don't think you can say you overpaid. You say in the question, you're happy with the card and you're happy with the purchase. Then it sounds like you got a great deal. Sounds like you got a great deal. So what comps sell for? That's almost like a suggestion. That's almost like, uh, well, this could be approximately what it's worth, but it doesn't mean that's what it's worth. At least it doesn't mean what it's worth to you, especially when we're talking vintage cards. When we're talking about newer stuff, where they're all right off the assembly line, they are all kind of interchangeable. But when you're talking about a card from, you know, 60 years ago, 70 years ago, and the coloring's different, and the edges are different, and the shine is different, and the corners are different, the centering's different, and the wax is different, and the marks are different, then if you find one that you like, and you're cool paying that, buy it, and don't look back. That would be my advice on it. What are your top five favorite sports movies? What is a good subject for a sports movie that hasn't been made yet? All right, movies, top five favorite movies, sports movies. Now, I appreciate you continuing to ask this question. I know you've asked it two or three times and I haven't gotten to it. So I was certain I was gonna make sure I got to it this week. So what are my five favorite sports movies? There are a lot of good sports movies out there. Um, I'm going to go ahead and, and just start listing what I think are my five. So um, I'm going to start with my favorite. My favorite sports movie of all time, I think, has to be Hoosiers. Hoosiers, there's something about, you know, farm boy basketball, growing up, shooting on the old hoop out in the middle of nowhere, small town taking on, you know, the big city teams, the power teams, overcoming obstacles. There's so much to the story in Hoosiers that I love that I think Hoosiers has to be, has to be my number one choice. Um, number two, what would I say? Um, I love The Natural. The Natural, Robert Redford, most things Robert Redford was in I like. Uh, you know, again, overcoming obstacles. Love that. I love the setting back, you know, historical setting back when baseball was everything for a lot of these towns and a lot of these fans. One that I think might go overlooked, but I love, I love documentaries. So I could probably pick a couple of documentaries in my top five. But the one that really started that off, if you haven't seen it yet, I think Hoop Dreams is a really good movie. It's a documentary on, it really follows a couple of kids who are coming up through, they're like going into their freshman year of high schools when it picks up and they kind of get scouted to be picked by this high school, private high school basketball program looking to rebuild and keep going with this. The team is always really good and it kind of takes them, takes you through their home life, their basketball journey from pretty much eighth grade through uh, about their freshman year of, of college. And I think it's really, really good. I really enjoy that movie. So Hoop Dreams is on my list. Caddyshack, you gotta have Caddyshack in the list, right? Especially as a golfer, gotta have Caddyshack. Anytime Chevy Chase is in a movie, I'm a big Chevy Chase fan. Um, classic movie. The hard one would be the four, fifth one. Um, I think I gotta go, I think I gotta go, who, uh, I think I gotta go Rudy. I love Rudy, right? I mean, there's so many things. Again, big dreams, you know, uh, overcoming obstacles again, storied program, Notre Dame. Uh, the, the soundtrack alone is awesome in Rudy, right? Uh, so much to like about the movie Rudy. Um, so I think that would be, that would be my list. So I'm going Hoosiers, The Natural, 
Hoop Dreams, Caddyshack, and Rudy. Those are my five I'm gonna go with. Um, let me know down below, what what do you guys think? What, what did I miss? I know I'm gonna get, I know I'm gonna get some Bull Durham's. I know I'm gonna get some uh, Field of Dreams. I know that. I know you guys are gonna hit me with that. There's probably gonna be some people talking about Miracle. What am I forgetting? But I think I'm sticking with my top five, but convince me otherwise down below. What, what is a top five uh, movie of all time? Uh, that sports movie of all time that I didn't include in my top five. Let me know what you think. Regarding a movie that they could make, how about Lou Gehrig? Or what about Evil Knievel? I think those two would be pretty interesting.